Okay, thank you, Raquel, for these smart words, and thank you for being with us here today. Um, our f first presentation of today addresses the care services for older people in Ireland. Um, the next speaker did her PhD in, at the uh, Oxford University and has written over 60 uh, peer-reviewed articles in, in international journals. Uh, I have the great pleasure to, to introduce Professor Vita Pitimonen from Trinity College, Dublin. Thank you very much, Antti, for that um, kind introduction. And thank you also to Kalebi Sorsa Foundation and to uh, Finansialan Keskusliitto for inviting me here. Um, and thank you all for coming to um, listen. Um, you are certainly not alone in being interested in and concerned about issues around care of older populations. I was just thinking when I was walking to this wonderful venue um, about the locations where so far this year I've been to speak about this very uh, matter in more comparative perspective, um, but nonetheless about um, care of older people. Uh, and they've been Vancouver in Canada, Perth in Australia, and just two days ago, Friday last, um, Reykjavik in, in Iceland. So I, th I think it is quite fair to say that it's, it's a global um, issue and wonderful to see the energy behind um, you know, wanting to improve um, older uh, people's services here in Finland. But um, I'm tasked with speaking about the case of Ireland. So let's start with some uh, key facts and figures. First of all, Ireland is, uh, in the Western context, still a very young country. Uh, that percentage, um, around 11 12% being 65 and over, many of you will know that that's only about half of uh, what it is in, in many other uh, European countries. However, a relatively large proportion of that older population are in various forms of institutional care, which also accounts for the clear majority of expenditure um, on care of older people, being one of the highest um, in the EU, that investment in institutional care. And when we look at more recent developments, uh, there has indeed been quite a lot of um, policy progress uh, with regard to institutional care, um, so that there is um, an entitlement, uh, although with some reservations, which I will explain later on, to financial support towards institutional um, uh, care, nursing home costs, and standards have also been introduced to govern um, the quality of institutional care. In contrast to that, the investment and policy development with regard to home and community care uh, lags behind. And many of you, you know, given the kind of stereotypical images of, of Ireland, Catholicism and the centrality of families, uh, will of course wonder, you know, what about the, the role of families? Um, now, you might be surprised to find out that there is no formal obligation to provide care. Uh, by family members, but as with regard to many things um, in in Ireland, it's not so much the <laughs> the formal rules and provisions that matter, but um, the reality. And I thought I would actually begin by um, very briefly um, introducing you to uh, two um, Irish people whom we interviewed uh, for a recent project on intergenerational solidarity in Ireland, um, and I will just introduce them to you because I think they will serve as quite useful reference points and um, sort of contextualization of um, the Irish case. And the first one of them is a 19-year-old um, girl called Stacy, um, who as part of um, this very long interview that we um, conducted with her, um, told us about her grandmother who has Alzheimer's disease. Um, and she told us, I'm just there to bathe her, wash her, dress her, cook the dinner. It's kind of a day care thing that I provide her with. And she went on to say that 
carers get paid the carers allowance, omaishoidon tuki, um, and stuff like that. But the fact that she is my granny, I shouldn't be paid to look after her, I feel. So keep, keep the case um, of Stacey in mind, because I, I am <laughs> very close to 100% sure that Stacey's don't exist in Finland. So, so this is a 19-year-old who has put her education and employment on hold, who is practically a full-time carer of her grandmother and who doesn't even think that she is entitled to any support whatsoever because it's her uh, filial family duty um, and obligation. However, so that you know, we, we don't pay, paint too familialistic um, a picture of Ireland, um, and to illustrate the other side of this coin of self-responsibility um, towards care, the second person that I would like you to meet um, is a 73-year-old man called Fred, whom I actually conducted this interview in person, and I asked him if you were, he was in good, good health at the time of the interview, but if you were to develop care needs in the future, where would you expect that care to come from? And he said straight away, I don't expect it to come from my children. So I was curious, I said, well, you don't expect any assistance at all from your children? And his response was, again, quite firmly, no, I don't. We have some investments. Those investments that I have for my wife and I, in our minds, they are to pay for whatever care we need. I planned to look after ourselves. So that's to illustrate, as I said, um, the other angle um, to the, uh, the fact that a lot of people do absorb costs, whether they're direct or indirect costs um, of care in Ireland. And, and this is the more better to do middle class pattern that is emerging, that older adults set aside money for the specific purpose of meeting their own care needs. Now, at, at the population level, we also have some um, fairly good um, data sets, um, new ones from a longitudinal study. Um, called TILDA, the Irish Longitudinal Study on Aging. And this has focused on community dwelling older people. Um, and so I'm just going to give you some uh, highlights from, from this study that, again, encapsulate um, aspects of what I've already hinted at, um, the fact that um, community care in Ireland is largely uh, family care. So nine out of 10 caregivers for community dwelling older people are unpaid, only one in 10 are paid. Um, and it's pretty intensive um, when it happens. Um, so among those older people who get help and support um, with personal care and household tasks, on average, they get about 30 hours per week. Um, now, in contrast to that, of course, there is some formal home and community care, um, but that is much, much, much less um, intensive. Um, so the vast majority who get formal home care get about one hour or less per week. Um, and also the providers of this formal home care um, are, 40% of them are not affiliated to any organization or company. Um, so you could say that could say that the, uh, the, the formal home care is, is quite informal as well, uh, with a lot of people who are hired um, on an informal basis or from the grey labour market. Um, and that's just, uh, you know, there's a wealth of um, statistics on this, but it's just to show that overall, um, in the total column there in the middle of the table, the, the percentages of the older population um, who get um, home help or personal care attendant or meal services in the home are um, pretty low. 
there's some evidence that uh, there's a reasonably good um, targeting of, of those services, though, for those with the highest um, level of need, those who have um, difficulties with both activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living. But certainly in the comparative um, perspective, relatively low percentages of older people who get these formal uh, care services in the home. Um, also, when we look at um, the older um, family caregivers, most of them are older. In fact, um, this is perhaps one of the kind of strengthening underpinnings of the Irish system because the um, demographics in the in the older cohorts, the cohorts that are entering old age now, are changing. Um, Ireland has had quite a distinctive marriage pattern where a large proportion of the older population has been unmarried um, due to basically poverty, um, low incomes, uh, but that percentage is, is declining um, quite rapidly for the oldest um, age groups and the life expectancy of men and women is converging. So we, we see this phenomenon of older spousal carers becoming um, increasingly important and um, replacing some of the adult sons and, and daughters who have traditionally been very heavily involved. Of course, such older spousal carers are older themselves, may have care needs themselves, um, and they are largely unsupported. So only about 10% currently get um, the carer's allowance. Um, now, if we look at the policy development since 2000 um, in the area of um, home care, where the, the vast majority of, of older adults are, there has been an expansion of, of formal care, but it has happened very much in the absence of a national plan or framework or legislation to, to guide that expansion. And it took place in tandem with um, much more policy progress with regard to residential care, so that, as I said, we, we now have, in theory, an entitlement to financial support um, with institutional care costs. Um, but, um, unfortunately, the way in which this works is that there's an annual budget, and as this extract uh, from the health services executive, which is the main sort of executive arm of health and social care in Finland, um, tells us, uh, it is hoped that there would be sufficient funding to support everyone who, who is deemed um, to have um, the level of care needs um, that requires institutional care. But there may be situations where a person's name must go on a national placement list until funding becomes available. So that entitlement is very much contingent on um, budgets. And also in the area of um, home care packages, which are a new um, cash for care type of um, entitlement. Um, again, uh, they are, in theory, Um, so in, in theory they sound pretty good because uh, because they're if you are again in, in the light of this needs assessment um, if you are deemed to have the level of care needs they they carry no cost they're part of the public health service um, but uh, crucially and in distinction to the home to the institutional care uh, th there is no entitlement as such and it's it's even more uh, based on these annual budget allocations. And again, uh, the official line is that um, the supports will be based on these assessed care need, subject to the limits of the resources available for the scheme in your area. Um, so what, what this means is that th there is um, you know, really quite disturbing degree of inequity in access to these forms of care, um, which arises from the fact that there is only a certain amount allocated towards the costs countrywide, 
per year, and then if you happen to be applying uh, for these um, supports at the wrong time of the year or in the wrong place, let's say if, if your local health area um, is not particularly dedicated to older people, older people's care, well, you know, then you, you don't get these um, supports. Um, and because the expensive forms of care, the more institutional forms of care, are more accessible and relatively cheaper at the higher level of care needs, um, they, there's actually a sort of inbuilt perverse incentive for people to seek out those um, rather than uh, the more appropriate and in many cases actually the, the cheaper forms of formal home care. Uh, the sector which remains unregulated or at best very variably uh, regulated based on contracts with the individual providers. Uh, and both forms of support for both home and institutional care are subject to cutbacks in funding. And this just illustrates um, how in practice this, this problem manifests itself. Um, it's from a letter that was um, formulated by a hospital in, in Dublin. Um, I'm on the board of that hospital. And it's outlining yet again um, that on this particular point in time, there were 124 um, patients who actually really didn't belong in the hospital anymore. They were totally inappropriately in this extremely expensive um, form of care. And 99 of them were waiting for LTC, stands for long-term care. And, and there were also a smaller number of delays waiting for these home care packages. And as I said, th this arises from uh, the fact that when the money has run out, well, it, it has run out, um, as well as various administrative um, deficiencies. I will very briefly say something about the, the background to these outcomes. I know you're not so interested in the sort of policy <laughs> failures, but I think it's maybe useful to also know why, why this, this situation has arisen. So first of all, you know, there is this massive concern about uncontrollable costs. Like if, if we give a genuine um, entitlement, then you know, it, it means that um, we will have to pay everybody who qualifies, uh, and that's a big fear. Um, this weakness of governance uh, structures and uh, short-sighted um, decision-making based on political gain. Uh, policy is usually done through these administrative guidelines, um, which um, you know don't really place any very firm obligations on on local units um, to provide home care. Uh, there's been, as part of this picture a high degree of openness to private provision and indeed several US-based, UK-based multinational companies have quite strong presence now um, in Ireland. Uh, the fact that media has focused mostly on institutional care scandals and abuses has helped drive that sector forward and held back um, the home care sector and also the institutional care sector is much better organized. Among the most uh, recent developments, it's um, not, not a surprise that private sector and not-for-profit sector providers have flourished because we have been operating under very, very uh, strict frameworks, um, partly to do, of course, with the fact that um, Ireland was not effectively self-governing until about a year ago with regard to its budgets. Um, so astonishingly, in the, in the public sector, the, the total number of new um, home help workers uh, was 35 <laughs> in, in that six-year uh, period. Um, now, there is some uh, talk about transferring funds from the nursing home support scheme towards primary care with earlier, with a focus on earlier discharge from hospitals. So hopefully something positive will, will happen in, in that space. Um, and also there's, there's a lot of contradictory uh, pressures on the one hand. Um, this sort of stronger orientation to outsourcing and contracting out of care provision, 
um, but then the Labour Court has recently um, ruled that really um, the public sector home help workers uh, should be prioritised when the the care um, provision is is being uh, um, allocated between the public, private, and non-profit sectors. So I will conclude um, by highlighting what I think um, is the most um, positive aspect of this, which you know is, is basically factors pertaining to demographic and cultural factors. So as I said, there's this falling share of the never married, increasing scope for spousal care, and as the examples of Stacy and Fred at the beginning of my talk illustrated, there is still the ability and willingness on, on behalf of um, some population groups to absorb the costs of care, whether that's through private savings and pay payments, as in the case of Fred, or, or through um, direct care provision, as in the case of Stacey. Uh, but of course, you know, the extent to which such demographic and cultural positives, if you like, can be transplanted to a very different demographic and cultural context like Finland is, is quite limited. Um, now, you might guess that I have more negative aspects on the basis of what I've said. Um, so, you know, of course, you know, if, if you're very, if you decide to be very reliant on, on individuals and their resources, um, there will also be a certain degree of uncertainty around exactly how far will they uh, stretch, especially as these older carers who are becoming um, increasingly important are largely unsupported. Um, and, you know, really, you, you have the Irish state is still very much struggling to, to shed its um, subsidiary role, which, which is um, it traditionally based on the Catholic principle of subsidiarity. Um, and, you know, it's really grappling to adopt a stronger and more directive role in financing, coordinating and regulating home care. And I think it's a very reasonable expectation looking forward that we will see increasing heterogeneity in the different care arrangements and likelihood of growing inequality in, in access to um, and quality of care. And so in, in systemic terms, the, the single, if I had to, I was asked to draw out one uh, major lesson, it, it would be that if, if you ration formal home care, which is where across all developed welfare states, the, the orientation is increasingly heading, you will pay the price in, in the form of expensive hospital and other institutional um, care types. And also, I would say through the indirect costs of home care. Uh, you, can, you can imagine the indirect costs, uh, again, going back to Stacey, our 19-year-old, who could not exist in, in Finland? Thank you.